Welcome to episode 35. Uh, this is the College Algebra Math 1050 class, and I'm Dennis Allison. Uh, today we have a, a quite different topic. We're going to talk about something called mathematical induction. And uh, this, is, uh, this is actually a, a, a process for uh, proving uh, infinitely many cases of a theorem. Now, uh, let me just begin with a few comments here before we go to our list of objectives. Uh, if you can go to the green screen, sc green screen I want to write down a few words here. Um, you know, in, uh, if you t took a course in logic, you'd find out that the term proposition or statement have the same meaning in logic, uh, whoops, statement. And uh, that is that these are these are um, uh, these are statements that, that can be given a true or a false truth value. So if I say a proposition or a statement in mathematics, I'm referring to something that can be determined to be true or false. Okay, and uh, now let's go to our list of objectives, and we're going to see how this has an effect on our discussion today. Uh, today we're going to look at how we can prove that a number pattern holds for infinitely many choices. Of, the, of that number. Then we'll look at the principle of mathematical induction, and then we'll look at some examples of mathematical induction. Now let's go to the next, uh, let's go to the next graphic, and we'll see a list of propositions. Uh, first of all, we say 1 equals 1. I think we could agree that's true. The next one says 1 plus 3 is 4. Yeah, that, one, that proposition's true. Uh, then 1 plus 3 plus 5 is 9. That's true, I think. And then 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 is 16. Uh, now, you notice on the left-hand side, what I'm doing is adding up consecutive odd numbers beginning with 1. 1, 1 plus 3, 1 plus 3 plus 5. And what about the numbers on the right, the sums? What do you notice about them? They're the squares. Those are squares, yeah. We have 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, and 4 squared. So in other words, we have an, what seems to be a number pattern that says if you add up consecutive odd integers, beginning with 1, then you get a square. And by the way, you notice that the number that's squared is the same as the number of odd integers on the left-hand side. So on that fourth line, for example, 16 is 4 squared, and I'm adding up 4 odd integers. So I guess we're, we might begin to wonder, is it true that if you add up the first, um, say, n odd integers, will you get n squared? And so that's the question that I ask. Is the sum of the first n consecutive odd integers always n squared? Now, if this is true, how could I go about proving it? Uh, now, you see, I think the difficulty here is that we have infinitely many cases to consider. And how can I prove this for infinitely many cases without writing them all down? And to write them all down would take, uh, I guess, an infinite amount of time. So it, it seems like it might be a, an impossible problem to actually prove or to disprove. Uh, Stephen, were you going to make a comment? Well, I was thinking um, if, you, if you make this like a square and, and like say like blocks or something, as you're looking at them, it always takes two more each time to well, fill it up. You know, as a matter of fact, we're going to be looking at a model for some of these problems using blocks. So I think you have a good idea. Uh, and I think you'll see that come up on a graphic here in just a minute. Okay, I tell you what. I'm going to go over here to the whiteboard and let's try let's just try examining this problem. See how we'll how we'll prove it. Okay. Um, now you see uh, we have the first proposition. I'm going to call it proposition number one, and that is that one equals one. And I think that's certainly true. Okay. And then I'm going to say proposition number two. So I'll just call it P. Proposition number two says that if you add up the first two odd integers, you get two squared, or in other words, four. And I think that's true. One plus three is four. And uh, then I have proposition three. Let's see, what would be proposition three? One, one plus three plus five. One plus three plus five, yeah, would be? It would equal three squared. Three squared, yeah, three nine. squared. And I'll just put a nine there. And that, that is true, by the way. And uh, I think the last one that we showed on our graphic was Proposition 4. And uh, Susan, what does Proposition 4 say? 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 mm -hmm. is 16. Equals 16. Yeah, four, 4 squared is 16. And let's see, that's true because 7 plus 3 is 10, and then 6 more is 16. So that one's true. <coughs> 
Now you might say, well, Dennis, uh, it looks like it worked in four cases. It must always be true. But somehow that doesn't sound like a logical argument to me. Just say it worked four times, so it must always work. Let's just try this one more time and see what it would uh, see what it would say. Um, I should write down the first five odd integers on the left hand side and put five squared on the right hand side. So one plus three plus five plus seven plus nine. Okay, so I've got five odd integers. And on the right hand side, 25. Now let's see, is that really 25? Well, you know, 9 and 1 is 10, 7 and 3 is 10, 20, and then 5 more is 25. So that was true. Well, now we're, we're, we're getting more confident all the time, but I don't see how we could, we could take this uh, sort of leap of faith and say it must always work for every positive integer n. So uh, instead, I'm going to have to find some approach that will, that will prove this uh, for all cases. So what I'm going to do is to start over again. But I'm going to write down what I'll call proposition n for the nth case, proposition n. Now, p sub n would be the case where I write down n odd integers on the left, and I'll put n squared on the right, because that would be how many, how many uh, odd integers there would be. So that would be 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7. Now, I claim that the nth odd integer is 2n minus 1. I'll come back and explain that in just a minute. And then this sum should equal, should equal what? If the proposition, if the pattern continues to hold. n squared? It should equal n squared. OK? <clears throat> now, I think people at home and students in the class here may wonder, well, is that really n odd integers? You put 2n minus 1. Well, I tell you what, just to count them, I'm going to add 1 to every one of those numbers and just list it right below here. Two. 4, 6, 8. And if I add 1 to that one, that would be 2n. Now, obviously, this isn't the same sum as that because all of these numbers have gotten bigger. I'm just wondering how many numbers there are here. Now, I'm going to divide by 2 all the way through that. And I have 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 up to, now if I divide by 2, that last number will be n. So how many numbers have I listed right there? 1, 2, 3, up to n. How many numbers can I say there are there? n. n numbers, OK. Now, there are just as many numbers here, because all I did is divide by 2, but I didn't delete any numbers. So there must be n numbers there. And that means there must be n odd numbers up above, because I didn't delete any there. All I did is add 1 to each of the odd numbers to make them even. So if I have n numbers here, then I have n numbers there. And therefore, I do have n odd integers up above. OK, so I've kind of gone all the way around the world to explain that that really is n odd integers. OK, so my goal then is to prove that this is true for every positive integer n. OK, so we want to prove that the proposition p of n is true for every positive integer n. Uh, you know, another name for positive integer, because if you look in your textbook, they may not say positive integer. Another name you could use here would be counting number for every counting number n. Because when you count, you count 1, 2, 3, 4, et cetera. And uh, so if n is any, is any uh, positive integer or counting number, so when n is 1, that means I only have one integer on the, on the left, and I have one squared on the right. When n is 2, then I have two odd integers on the left, and I have two squared on the right, uh, et, et, et cetera. OK, well, uh, now how would I go about proving that this is always true? Well, the procedure that I want to demonstrate here is a procedure known as mathematical induction. So let's write that term down. And basically, uh, the principle of mathematical induction involves only two steps. Now, you might think it should involve infinitely many steps, because if I were going to establish each one of these statements individually, there would be, in, there'd be infinitely many of those statements. I think we actually verified five of them. But uh, for mathematical induction, there are only two steps. And here's what the two steps are. Uh, first of all, you have to show that the proposition is true for the very first choice of n. And the smallest choice of n would be 1. That's the smallest of the counting numbers. 
So I, I, what I want to do is to establish that this is true. I'll put a question mark because that would have to be established. And then the next step is to show that if the proposition is true for an integer k, then the proposition for the next consecutive integer, k plus 1, is also true. So I have to show that if it's true for one integer, it's true for the next integer after that. You know, this is very much like lining up dominoes when you're going to, when you set dominoes on end and you line them up to knock them down. Uh, is imagine here that this is a tabletop, and suppose that I were to set up a, a, a domino there, and then a domino here, and then a domino here, and then a domino there, etc. And I keep lining these up so that they sort of follow a little path or trail. And I have them lined up so that if, I, if any domino falls, the one after that will fall. That's sort of what this statement says right here. If the proposition is true for k, then it must be true for the one after that. So if, if a domino falls over, then the next one must fall over. But that doesn't mean all the dominoes fall down, because I have to get this started. I have to push over the first domino. And that's what, that's what the first part does, is it gets it started by saying proposition number one is true. So if I knock over the first domino, and then if I have them arranged so that if the kth domino falls over, then the k plus first domino falls over, then that allows this procedure to continue. This second part is sometimes referred to as the inductive step. I wouldn't ask you that, but that's, that's, a, that's a name that's sometimes given for part b. So we have, to, we have to get this initiated by pushing over the first domino, and then we have to have them arranged so that when one falls, the next one falls. Okay, so if I can establish these two things, then shall we say all the dominoes fall over, or back to this problem, the proposition is true for all natural numbers. Okay, well let's see how that would go. The first thing I want to do is to establish that the proposition is true for p equals 1. Okay, so over here on the side, let me just ask this as a question, is p of 1 true. Well, let's see now. Actually, I think we've already seen that p of 1 is true. What that would say is, if I list the first odd integer on the left, is it equal to 1 squared? Now, you know, actually, there is no addition taking place on the left-hand side. There's only, one, there's only one number to write down. But I'm listing only the first odd integer. And yes, it does equal 1 squared. 1 does equal 1. And that's the proposition. At the, at the very trivial level uh, when I substitute in 1. Now we come to part b. Part b says, if p of k is true, then is p of k plus 1 true? And I'll put a question mark on that. OK, so this will take a little bit more space and a little bit more time to verify, but it's not difficult to verify. I'm going to start off by supposing that p of k is true, and then I want to prove that p of k plus 1 is true. So let's say, suppose <coughs> uh, p of k is true. Now, I'm assuming k is some positive integer. It could be 1, it could be 2, it could be 110. It just represents sort of an arbitrary uh, integer along the way. Now, when I suppose p of k is true, I'm assuming then when I write down the first k odd numbers that I'll get k squared. So this means that if I write 1 plus 3 plus 5 up to the kth odd number, well, let's see, if that was the nth odd number, the kth odd number must be 2k minus 1. And I'm assuming this is equal to k squared, because I'm assuming that it is true at the k level. So now I ask, is p of k plus 1 true? Well, I don't know. We'll have to find out. Uh, what I'm going to do is write down the first k plus 1 odd numbers, and I'm going to see if it equals k plus 1 squared. So let's try that. Uh, the first k plus 1 odd numbers would be 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus. OK, now if I want to get the k plus first odd number, uh, I think I'll use this formula. If I want the nth odd number, I put an n right there. And if I want the kth odd number, I put a k there. And if I want the k plus first odd number, I'll put k plus 1 there. 
Okay, so I'm just substituting in k plus 1 instead of n, and so that makes this the k plus first odd number. I could actually multiply that out and simplify it a little bit. What would I like to show that this is equal to? What, what am I hoping it's equal to, although I don't know it yet? k plus 1 squared. k plus 1 squared. Okay, let me just write that over here. Um, I'm thinking I would like for this to become k plus 1 squared, but, uh, but I, I couldn't put that in there yet because I don't know it. I'm trying to prove. I'm trying to prove the proposition is true for k plus 1. Uh, I tell you what, can anyone tell me what was the number that came just before 2 times k plus 1 minus 1? What, let's see, I better make a little bit more room for that. What would come just before this odd number? 2 times k minus 1. 2 times k minus 1. Uh, Jeff, tell us how you decided that. Because um, I took the series that we'd been um, working in in the earlier part there. Yeah, up here. Yeah. And that's the term that comes right. Before we did up to the k term, now we're doing to the k plus 1 term. So the Right. Uh, see, now, you see, if I just <coughs> plugged in k plus 1 to get the k plus first term, then the one that I get here should be just plug in a k, not a k plus 1. That'll be 2k minus 1. Now, some people at home, and maybe some of you might be thinking, I don't know, I don't, didn't quite follow that. This is the right answer, but here's another way to look at it. What if I multiply this out? That's 2k plus 2 minus 1, which is 2k plus 1. Okay, now these numbers are increasing by 2. So if I want to go backwards, I should decrease that by 2. And if I decrease that by 2, I'll have 2k minus 1 instead of 2k plus 1. So either you can replace the k plus 1 with a k, and you'll find the number just before it. Or you can multiply it out and reduce it by 2, and you'll get the number just before it. OK, so what I have here is 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus. Now I'm listing the last two numbers of this series, 2k plus 1. And I went ahead and wrote down, the, wrote down that simpler form. Now, you know, if I put parentheses around this portion, maybe I should say square brackets around this portion, um, we are assuming we know what that sum is because, you see, that's what appears in my assumption that P of K is true, that 1 plus 3 plus 5 up to 2K minus 1 is K squared. So my assumption is that this is equal to K squared, so I'm just going to put a K squared right there and then add on that extra term that I didn't have accounted for. Okay, so what I've done is I've replaced this long summation with what I'm assuming it's, uh, oh, 2k plus 1, thanks. Yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm replacing this summation with the k squared that I'm assuming it's equal to. Now, if I drop the parentheses there, this is k squared plus 2k plus 1. And uh, if I factor that, what will I get? k plus 1 quantity squared. k plus 1. Squared, exactly. And that's what I was hoping that I could make this uh, become. So if I assume that the proposition is true for k, then I've just shown that it's true for k plus 1. So to, in conclusion, we can say, so p of k plus 1 is true also. Of course, it's only true if I know that the one just before it is true, because I had to make this substitution right here uh, in order to reduce that. Well, if you establish A and if you establish B, our conclusion is that this proposition is true for every possible N. So uh, that is for every natural number N or counting, counting number N. Uh, so that's, that's how the proof goes. Now, this is, uh, this is a little, uh, little mind-boggling to see this the first time, so I think we better work another example. Let's go to the next graphic and we'll see another problem. Okay, this problem says, um, we have 1 over 1 times 2 is a half. And then the next row says, the next equation says, 1 over 1 times 2 plus 1 over 2 times 3 uh, reduces to be 2 thirds. And then on the, third, uh, on the third equation, we have 1 over 1 times 2 plus 1 over 2 times 3 plus 1 over 3 times 4 is 3 over 4. Now, do you notice any pattern in, first of all, the numbers on the left-hand side? They're all fractions. Uh, but what about the denominators? What do you notice about them? 
there's a product of two integers. Product of two consecutive integers, okay. And, and the numerators are all one. Uh, and also, what is the first number in each product? Let's see, it's a one and then it's a two. In other words, it's sort of the same as the position number. The fraction in the first position begins with one. The fraction in the second position begins with a two. So it's one over one times two plus one over two times three. Does that pattern hold in the third, on the third line? See, yeah. we have three fractions. We have ones in the numerator. And in the denominator, we have a pair of consecutive fractions. And the first number, that is the one on the left in the pair, is the same as the position number. One over one times two, one over two times three, one over three times four. And uh, in the fourth line, I haven't given the answer for that, but you notice the pattern continues there. Uh, one over one times two, plus one over two times three, et cetera, till the last one is one over four times five. Okay, now, what's the pattern in the answers on the right-hand side? We have uh, one half, then we have two thirds, then we have three fourths. Um, do you see any pattern in that? The numerator and the denominator are the are the two numbers in the denominator of the last term on the uh, left. Hey, very, that's very good. Yeah, you notice that uh, the fraction on the right that represents the sum uh, is a ratio of two consecutive numbers, and they happen to be the numbers in the right-hand fraction of the summation, uh, the, the two numbers in that denominator. Uh, one over two, two over three, three over four. So if you were going to guess an answer to the fourth sum, what would you guess it is? Four over five. Four, four over five, yeah, because uh, that, that fourth fraction is one over four times five, and if I take the ratio of those two numbers, four over five, that should be the answer. Now, of course, if I actually go back and add up all four of those fractions on the fourth line, uh, I could find out if four over five really is the answer or not. But that wouldn't really do us that much good, so we might establish this pattern one more time if it works. But, you know, what we're really wondering is, does this always work even if you have, say, a hundred fractions written across there, so that the, if, if I wrote a hundred of them, the last fraction would be one over a uh, hundred times a hundred and one, and the answer should be a hundred over a hundred and one. Will that, will that work all the time for every natural number or for every positive integer? So what number pattern is suggested here? I think we've decided, but will this always hold? How do I go about tackling a problem that has infinitely many cases uh, that I can't verify individually because there's just not enough time in a lifetime to verify every case separately? So instead, I'm going to use mathematical induction. Let's come back to the green board and let's decide what proposition P of N would be in this case. Well, let's see. What we start off with is 1 over 1 times 2 plus 1 over 2 times 3 plus 1 over 3 times 4 dot, dot, dot. Now, the reason I say dot, dot, dot is because I don't really know how big n is going to be. There's no way I could actually list every one of those fractions because we don't know what the value of n is. Uh, but the last fraction should be n times n plus 1. Because we noticed that in all of the cases that we had in that example, there was a consecutive pair of integers multiplied together here. And the first integer was the same as the position number. And this is supposed to be the nth fraction because it's the nth proposition. So it's n times its successor, uh, n plus 1. Now, um, we, should, we, we are guessing then that the sum of these fractions should be what? What expression? In, in terms of n, how will I write that? n over n plus 1. n over n plus 1, yeah. And where I come up with that answer is by looking at the pattern of the examples that we just saw on the previous graphic here. Now, is this always true? That's the, that's the question that we're asking here. So there are two things that I have to establish. First of all, I have to establish that P of 1 is true. And then I have to establish that if P of K is true, that implies that P of K plus 1 is true. This is where, where K is a positive integer. Yeah, so I have to establish that the, that the very first case is true and that any time it's true, the one after that will be true. So uh, how do we go about doing that? Well, I don't think it's that difficult to establish A. Let's just look at that right here. 
proposition P of 1 uh, would say that if I take the very first fraction, which is 1 over 1 times 2, that I should get the ratio of 1 over 2. Now, let me ask you, is that true? Yes. Yeah, there's only one fraction to write on the left, so I'd, I really can't say that I'm adding up any fractions. There's only one to write down. And if I take the ratio of those two uh, integers in the denominator, 1 over 2, that does give me the answer. That's the pattern that we saw here for the case where n was equal to 1. Now, let's go to part b. I'm going to suppose that p of k is true. And what I want to do is prove that p of k plus 1 is true. Well, when I say I'm assuming p of k is true, it means I'm assuming that this number relationship is valid for n equals k. So that means um, that means I'm assuming that 1 over 1 times 2 plus 1 over 2 times 3 plus up to 1 over k times k plus 1, because we're talking about the proposition k, should equal k over k plus 1. That's the ratio of these two consecutive integers. Okay, now. Uh, we don't have to prove that's true because this is what we're supposing is the proposition for k is true. Now, we ask the question, is the proposition for k plus 1 true? And you might say, well, I don't know, Dennis, what is proposition for k plus 1? Well, that, that's the proposition that says 1 over 1 times 2 plus 1 over 2 times 3 plus 1 over 3 times 4 plus... Now, if I go to the k plus 1 fraction, I'm going to have the product of two consecutive integers on the bottom. What will I put in these two blanks for the k plus first proposition? k plus 1 times k plus 2? Yes, exactly. k plus 1, k plus 2. And uh, because uh, if this is the k plus first fraction, it begins with k plus 1. And what are we guessing the answer should be if the proposition is true? k plus 1 over k plus 2. k plus 1, right, over k plus 2. Very good. Now, I don't know if this sum is equal to that or not. So we're going to have to do a little, uh, a little uh, figuring to determine that. I'll tell you what, what, what would be the fraction that comes just before this one? I bet there'll be a 1 in the numerator. What else? K in the denominator would be K, K times K plus 1. K times K plus 1. Because you see, if this is the K plus first fraction, this must be the Kth fraction, so it's the one that starts off with a K. Now, that's interesting because if I put brackets around this portion, then I have a substitution for that because we're assuming that the proposition for k, or at k, is true. And that's the summation that goes up to 1 over k times k plus 1. That's what I have in here. And it's equal to k over k plus 1. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this portion out and substitute k over k plus 1. But I still have that extra term to add on, 1 over k plus 1, k plus 2. And if I get a common denominator for that, let's see, k plus 1 times k plus 2, um, what would be the new numerator for the first fraction if I'm trying to get that denominator? What's the new numerator going to be? k times k plus 2. K times K plus 2. Yeah, because we had to multiply by K plus 2 on the bottom, we need to multiply by that on top, plus 1 over K plus 1, K plus 2. Now, I've gotten a common denominator. If I add those two together, <coughs> let's see, that'll be K plus 1, K plus 2. Then I'm going to have, uh, let's see, K squared plus 2K plus 1. Uh, now, let's see, how could I factor k squared plus 2k plus 1? k plus 1 squared. That is k plus 1 squared. Let me just write that up above it. That is k plus 1 squared. And if I cancel off one of the k plus 1s, what I'm left with is k plus 1 over k plus 2. And that's exactly what we said we were going to predict, or that, that we had predicted we were going to get right there. So, of course, now we're all excited about this. Okay, those of you who can't see them at home, they're all excited about this. So what we've done is we've established the proposition is true for the first case. And for any k for which it is true, the one after that will be true. So, in other words, if it's true for 1, it must be true for 2. 
But then, wait a minute, if it's true for two, then it must be true for three. And if it's true for three, it must be true for four. And so all the dominoes fall down, you see. So mathematical induction is a procedure that allows us to take uh, a statement which has infinitely many uh, variations, varieties, and it gives us a way of establishing that the proposition is true for all those, all those positive integers in that case. Okay, uh, let's go to the next graphic and look at another induction uh, proof, because I think we need to do several of these for everyone to get the hang of how the procedure goes. <coughs> okay, in the next problem, uh, it says prove that if you add 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared up to n squared, there's a formula for the sum of the squares, and that is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. So in other words, if you want to add up consecutive squares beginning with 1 squared, the little formula on the right actually doesn't look so little. It has, a, has three different factors in the numerator. But uh, they, the expression on the right will calculate that sum. Now, you know, at first glance, you might think, I don't even know if that's true at all. So let's just take a few cases to kind of get the feel for what that's about. So if you come back to the green board, what if I were to take 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3? Oh, you know, I ought to write down the general statement first. So the proposition is that 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared up to n squared the, that sum is always equal to something over 6. It was n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. Now, th this seems like, uh, this, seems like this, this, is, uh, this would be too, too much to believe that we could always find the sum of the squares with a single formula. Let's just take a case. What if I take 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared? Uh, which proposition would you say that one is that I'm beginning to write down? is that uh, now this is p sub n. So what I'm beginning to write down here is p of what? Three. P of 3. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the case where n is equal to 3. And for that case, I should put a 3 in right here. Well, if I put a 3 for n, that'll be a 3. Uh, what will this number be, n plus 1? If n is 3. Four. It'll be what, Susan? 4. It'll be a 4, yeah. And what will the last number be? Uh, 7. Yeah, 2 times 3 plus 1 is 7, okay? Now, uh, let's see, if I can't, there, here's a 12. If I cancel a 6 and 12, I get a 2. That's going to be 14. So the formula says this answer is 14. But is it really 14? Well, let's see, 1 plus 4 plus 9 is 14. Yeah, that, that really does work. You say, well, okay, Dennis, maybe you got lucky. So it works for the case n equals 3, but will it work for the case n equals 2, or n equals 4, or n equals 7, or n equals 100. In other words, every time I prove one case, you might say, yes, but does it work for some other case? So how am I going to show that this works all the time for every positive integer n? And of course, the answer is to use mathematical induction. So rather than trying to establish an individual case, like the one we just saw, saw let's show that it'll work for every positive integer. OK, so there are two things that I have to establish. Who can tell me what's the first thing I'll have to establish? That it works for the first term? For the first term. OK, now that would be when n was 1. Yeah, because see, n is supposed to be the last square. So if I only wrote down the first term, n would be 1. So we should establish the proposition uh, that p of 1 is true. So I'll put a question mark after that. And then what's the other thing I'll have to establish? This is a little bit more complicated. This is the inductive step. Matt, what were you going to say? I just said it'll work for every term after n. Uh, well, not or after, after or n. after the first one. After. Okay, well, I, wa I want to show that it works for every term after the first one, but that's not how we worded the inductive step. How did, how did we say it? We have to it? prove that it's true for p of k. Okay, we have to show that if p of k is true, that that would imply... p of k plus 1 is true. That p of k plus 1 is true. So you see why this proposition calling it p is kind of a nice notation, because this abbreviates writing all that out for the k, for at the k level, or the k plus 1 level. OK, so let's put our proof right below it here. First of all, I want to establish that it is true for 1. Now, if I write down the first square, well, there it is. And if I substitute in 1 on the other side, will these be equal? Let's see, 1 times 2 times 3 over 6. 
Yeah, I'm just plugging in a 1 for n, and I get 1 times 2 times 3 over 6. Are those two things equal? Yeah. Yes, yes. they are. 1 equals 1, yeah. Or 1 equals 1. So what we've established here is that p, the proposition at 1, is true. Yeah, and I'll put an exclamation mark because we're, we're all excited at this moment, okay? Now we come to part b. And in this case, this is a little bit more involved. I'm going to assume that it's true for p equals k. That is, I'm assuming that the kth domino has fallen over. The question is, will the domino after that fall over? So I'm going to suppose that p of k is true, okay? Uh, that is, I'm assuming that if you add up the first k squares, the first k squares, that would be 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared up to k squared. You would get the expression on the right when you substitute k for n. That would be k times k plus 1 times 2k plus 1 all over 6. Okay, so this is something I get for free because it's my assumption. So I'm going to use that in a moment, and I don't have to prove it because I'm assuming that it's true for the k, for the k, for the k level. Okay, so we ask the question, is p of k plus 1 true? Well, let's see. Is it true? Uh, well, to find out, I'm going to add up the first k plus 1 squares, and I'm going to see if I get the expression on the right with a k plus 1 in it. So uh, 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared up to k plus 1 squared equals... Uh, and by the way, while we're at it, what, what number would come just before k plus 1 squared? What would come just before that square? Like before 3 squared is 2 squared. Okay, before squared. 5 squared, I bet, is 4 squared. And before k plus 1 squared is k, squared. Uh, is k squared. Yeah. Now, you know, this is the third example. And if you think back to the other examples that I've worked, I've done something like that in every one of these problems. I've written out the k plus first term, but then I backed up and I wrote the, the term just before it. And I think we'll see why in just a moment. Now, let's see if we can figure out what is the answer we would like to get. If I were to put in a k plus 1 right here, let's see, this will be over 6. If I put in a k plus 1 right here, k plus 1, what would be the next thing, the next factor after that? If n is k plus 1, then what's n plus 1? k plus 2. k plus 2, very good. k plus 2. Okay, and now this next one's a little tricky. If I put a k plus 1 right there, what is 2 times k plus 1 plus 1? Well, let's, let's just work that out. 2 times k plus 1 plus 1. How much will that be? 2k plus 3. 2k plus 3. Yeah, that's going to be 2k plus 2 plus 1. So this will be 2k plus 3. Three. So this is what I'm wondering if I will get for an answer. Okay, well, let's find out. Can anyone tell me, back, back here at the original problem, I, I've included the term just before k plus 1 squared. What am I going to do now? Take everything from 1 squared up to k squared and say yeah. that that's all equal to um, the p to the k. Yeah, let's see. Over here, we're assuming that 1 squared through k squared, that's exactly what Jeff has boxed off there, is equal to this fraction, this rational expression. So let's substitute that in. That's uh, k times k plus 1 times 2k plus, uh, whoops, plus 3. Uh, no, that's right, plus 1. Yeah, the, the plus 3 is in that one. All over 6. But then we're adding on one more term, k plus 1 squared. So I'm hoping that I can make this sum add up to be the answer that we're expecting right there. Uh, what would you do to, to simplify that? I'm thinking, why don't we get a common denominator? So let's, let's get it all over 6. So this would be uh, k times k plus 1 times 2k plus 1 plus 6 times k plus 1 squared. Now, you know, I don't think we'd want to multiply that all out. That looks kind of complicated. But I think we should factor it. Do you see any common factors in the numerator? Are there any common factors in this expression right here? K plus 1. There's a K plus 1, so let's factor that out. 
Okay. You know, this is promising because look in my answer, there's a k plus one factor there. So it looks like maybe we're going in the right direction. Now, what would be left over? Well, I would have k plus one and times two k plus one. So let's put that here. Uh, no, I'd have, a, excuse me, I'd have a k times a two k plus one. k times two k plus one. And over here, I'd have a six times a k plus one because I've already taken one of the k plus ones out. Okay, so now I think at this point I will have to factor it. I'll have to multiply it out because I don't see any way I could factor that further. So k plus 1 times, uh, let's see, uh, just looking at this, I see there's going to be a 2k squared, and I don't see any other k squareds coming up, so it'll be a 2k squared. And then um, it looks like we're going to get a k right there. And here we're going to get 6k, that's 7k altogether. And then we're going to get a constant term. Now, there, there's no constants that will be generated here. What's the constant term that I'll get there? 6. Plus 6. And this is all over 6. Okay. Now, you know what? This binomial factors, and I'm sort of running out of room here, but this factors to be the last two binomials that I have right there. Um, let's see if I can squeeze this in here. K plus 1. And now I want to factor this quadratic and put it all over 6. Now there's a 2K squared there, so I figure I'm going to need a 2K and a K. And I need to factor 6. Oh, by the way, there's a plus there. That tells me the signs are alike. There are a plus in the middle, so that tells me one of the signs is positive, so they must both be positive. And then to factor 6, I think I'll want to put a 3 here and a 2 there, and that will give me 7K. And that's exactly the answer that I was uh, hoping to arrive at. So therefore, if it's true for one integer, it's true for the next integer. OK, so we've therefore proven that this proposition is true for every positive integer. Uh, now, let's look at an application of this. I guess you could call this an application. Let's look at the, next, uh, at the next graphic. The question says, how many blocks are in the array shown if the bottom layer is 100 by 100? Now, you notice there's one block on the top layer. How many blocks are on the second layer, assuming that four. there, are no, there are no missing blocks underneath? Looks like there are four. And on the next layer, how many blocks? On the third layer down? Nine. Nine. So. Uh, and then the next one that we see is 4 by 4, 16. So we've got 1 block plus 4 blocks plus 9 blocks plus 16 blocks all the way down to 100 by 100. Now, if I were to write those as squares, uh, I think I could write them this way. Let's just come back to the board here and figure out how many blocks there are in that array. Of course, the array is bigger than we can actually see on the graphic, but you get the, you get the idea of what it looks like. So on the, on the very top, we had 1 squared. And then just below it, we had 4 blocks. That's 2 squared. And then just below that, we had a 3 by 3 array, 9 blocks. That's 3 squared. And we keep on going until we get to the very bottom layer. And we said that was 100 by 100. That's 100 squared. So how many blocks are there? Well, of course, one way to do it would be to multiply all those out. There'd be 100 numbers there then to add up. That would take quite a while to do it. Uh, what would be a shortcut for answering that question? Use our formula that we yeah. have derived. Yeah, you know, we, we work so hard to derive this formula, we ought to at least use it now. What would you substitute for n? 100. Yeah, it looks like n is 100. So if I substitute 100, uh, substitute 100 that's 100 times 101 times, um, what's the last number? 201. 201. Now, you know, you might think that when you divide by 6, you might say, well, Dennis, it seems like there would be some times when this 6 may not cancel. And if the 6 doesn't cancel, you're going to get a fraction for the answer. And if you get a fraction for the answer, that's impossible because you can't have a bunch of squares adding up to be a fraction. Well, you know, this 6 will always cancel. That's what we've just proven in our inductive proof, our mathematical induction proof, is that this always reduces to whatever the sum is, and this sum is an integer, so the 6 has to cancel. For one thing, you notice these are both, these, these are consecutive integers, so one of them has to be even, the other one's odd. So that means the 2 and the 6 is going to cancel there. And one of these three numbers has to be a multiple of 3. That's not necessarily obvious, but one of them will be. 
So let's see, if I cancel the two with the 100, um, I'll make that 50. And which one of those numbers is divisible by three? 201. 201, if I cancel the three with the 201, that'll be 67. So this answer is gonna be 50 times 101 times 67. Now I tell you what, can anyone tell me what is 67 times 101? It has a nice pattern to it. 67 Six times 101. 6,767. Yeah, it's 6767. Six, you see, 67 times 1 is 67, and then 67 times 100 is 6,700, so it's 6767. Six, then if I multiply uh, 50 times that, this number is going to end in a zero. And now let's just multiply by 5. 5 times 7 is 35, carry a 3. 5 times 6 is 30, that makes 33, carry a 3. 5 times 7 is 35, we carry to 3, makes it 38. And then 5 times 6 is 30, and we carry to 3, makes it 33. So we get 338,350. So there are almost a third of a million, or over a third of a million blocks in that display if the bottom layer is 100 by 100. So I've been able to find the number of blocks in the array without actually adding up all those numbers individually but using my shortcut formula. Okay, let's see. Um, I think we should skip the next graphic and the one after that and let's move along to some of the later graphics um, so we don't uh, miss, so we don't lose too much time here. On the next graphic we have a question, which is larger n squared or 2 to the n if n is a whole number? Uh, now, you know, n squared grows very rapidly, but 2 to the n grows rapidly as n gets bigger. So which one is larger? And uh, then we're supposed to prove our answer. Well, you know, to decide, I think what we should do is just sort of investigate it for a few cases. So what if I make a table and uh, we'll put n and we'll put n squared and we'll put 2 to the n power? And let's say uh, the question asked about whole numbers. Now, whole numbers include zero as well as positive integers. So let's just list a few cases here. Uh, zero through five. We could put down some more if we need them. Uh, well, n squared would be zero. What would be two to the zero? One. Would be one. Okay, so it looks like two to the n is bigger than n squared. Do you, so do you think that's enough to decide, okay, two to the n is always going to be bigger than n squared? Sure. Uh, Steven says sure, but uh, I think Steven's wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's only one case, so let's go further. Uh, what if I plug in a one? One squared is one, and two to the first, two to the first is two. Yeah, so, so far it looks like two to the n is bigger than two squared. Uh, what if I substitute n equals two? What'll be n squared? Four. 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 And what's two to the second? Four. Four. Oh, now wait a minute. Here they're equal, so two to the n isn't bigger. And what happens for three? What's three squared? Nine. Nine. And uh, two to the third is eight. So now suddenly n squared is bigger than eight. So I guess from now on, the square is bigger than the exponential. But maybe we ought to check a few more cases. What's, uh, what's four squared? Sixteen. Sixteen. And what's two to the fourth power? 16. 16. So, wait a minute, now they're equal again. So, it looks like this thing is sort of fickle, it's going back and forth. Let's go to 5. How about 5 squared is 25. What's 2 to the fifth power? 64. Uh, no, not 64. 32. 32. Uh, 32. Yeah, if you just double the last number. See, we put in one more 2, that'll be a 32. Um, maybe we should go just a few more cases. Let's try 6 and 7. 6 squared is 36. And uh, 2 to the 6th is 64. And 7 squared is 49. And 2 to the 7th is um, 128. What do you think is going to happen from here on out? 2 to the n is going to be bigger. Looks like 2 to the n is going to be bigger. So it looks like from this point on, 2 to the n is bigger than n squared. So we now have something we'd like to prove. And the question then is to prove that n squared is less than 2 to the n if n is um, if n is 5 or larger, if n is greater than or equal to 5. And by the way, I'm assuming n here is a positive integer now, not just a fraction or a decimal, but we're talking about 
uh, positive integers in this case. So in other words, in, the first, in these first five cases, we had some uh, waffling back and forth. But we're guessing that from five on, the two to the n is going to be bigger. So to prove this, I have to show two things. I have to show that the proposition here, this being the proposition, is true for the smallest case. Now, in this case, what's the smallest value of n? Five. It's five, OK? So I have to prove that p at 5 is true. Not p at 1, because p at 1 and 2 and 3 and 4, those are cases that we all eliminated earlier. And then I have to show that if the proposition is true for k, then it's true for k plus 1. Now, this is going to take a little, bit, um, a little bit different argument, I think, than what we saw in the first examples. So let's see if we can establish part a. Uh, p at 5. Well, if I plug in a 5, 5 squared is less than 2 to the fifth, because that's 25 is less than 32. So what that tells me is the proposition is true for 5. Yeah, so we have, we have that first part established. OK, let's go to part B. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm going to assume that the proposition is true for k. So let's say, suppose p k is true. And uh, what that means is I'm assuming that k squared is less than 2 to the k. Now, what I want to do is to prove that proposition k plus 1 uh, is true, p of k plus 1. So, uh, we must show p of k plus 1 true. Now, let's see. Uh, what that would say, then, is I want to prove that k plus 1 squared is less than 2 to the k plus 1. So let's write down k plus 1 squared. And somehow, I want that to be less than 2 to the k plus 1. So I'll just make a note of that. That's what I'd like to get on the other side. Well, if I expand this, this is k squared plus 2k plus 1. Now, I tell you what, I'm going to take out pieces of this and replace them with things that are larger. For example, what do I know is larger than k squared? How about 2, two to, to the, the k? k? We know that's larger. That's our assumption. I'll put 2 to the k there. And while I'm at it, I'm going to take out, I'm going to take out the 1, and I'm going to replace it with another 2k. I think we can all agree that 2k is bigger than 1 because we know that k that k is at least 5 or larger. So 2k is certainly bigger than 1. Now what that means this expression equals is 2k, uh, 2 to the k, plus 4k. Now one more time, I'm going to take out something here and put in something even bigger. Something bigger than 4 is k. Yeah, because uh, k is at least 5, so I can replace 4 with k. And so that gives me 2 to the k plus k squared. OK, now let's take out the k squared and put something even bigger than that. What's bigger than k squared? How about 2 to the k again? Yeah, we've already, we've already done that once. So I'm going to replace this with uh, 2 to the k plus 2 to the k. Now you know what I have then is 2 times 2 to the k. And uh, you know, I have the same base, so I should add exponents. And if I add exponents, that's 2 to the what? k plus 1. 2 to the k plus 1. And why are we all excited? Hmm. Why, are, why, why, why is Dennis all excited? Because on the other side was k plus 1 squared, and yeah, now well, that's see, exactly see, this we is what we for. said we wanted to get. We wanted to get 2 to the k plus 1. Now, this took quite a bit of maneuvering to replace individual terms with things that were larger to get to this, to get to this final answer. But we've been able to make k plus 1 squared less than 2 to the k plus 1. So what we've proven is that over here in our chart, for all the cases 5 and larger, 2 to the n is bigger than n squared for every other case after that. Now, we noticed there was a little bit of uh, movement back and forth in the early stages. But when we got to the point where we thought it would always be true, then we went to our inductive argument in that case. OK, um, let's go to the last graphic on the Fibonacci sequence. And let me just mention a few things about that. And I'm going to go over here to the green screen again. 
Uh, you remember the Fibonacci sequence? Um, uh, if, you, if you come to the green screen, let me just refresh everyone's memory how this goes. In the Fibonacci sequence, we started off with two ones, and then how did we get all the terms after that? You add um, the two previous terms to get the You new add term. the two previous terms, like one plus one is two, one plus two is three, two plus three is five. What would be the next term after that? Eight. Eight, okay. Now in this graphic, I'm calling the first number f sub one to mean Fibonacci number number one. Uh, and then f sub 2 and f sub 3, et cetera. So, for example, f sub 3 is really 2. It's just this is an abbreviation for that. Now, if we go back to the graphic, we'll see some properties of the Fibonacci sequence that can be established by induction. Uh, a few of the curious properties of the Fibonacci sequence, f1, f2, f3, et cetera, f sub n, and then keep on going. Well. You may not have been aware of this, but if you add up the first n numbers of the Fibonacci sequence, you get the number two steps later minus one. Yeah, let's come back to the green screen. And let me demonstrate that. What if I add up the first two numbers of the Fibonacci sequence, one and one? I get the number two steps later minus one. Yeah, one and one is two, and three minus one is, is two. Uh, what if I add up the first three numbers, one and one and two, how much is that? Four is four, and look, if I skip over two places, that's five minus one. What if I add up the first four numbers in the Fibonacci sequence? I get uh, seven, and that's eight minus one. So as a general rule, if we go back to the graphic again one more time, if you add up the first n numbers of the Fibonacci sequence, you get the number two steps later minus one. Now to prove that, you use induction. If I had time, I would prove that now, but I think uh, I'll just state it, and I'll leave it to you to think about. Now in the second line, uh, it says if you add up every other Fibonacci number, beginning with the first one, the first, the third, the fifth, up to f sub 2n minus one, remember 2n minus one is odd, we get f sub 2n, which is the very next Fibonacci number. Um, and by the way, if you look at the last line, it says if you add up the squares of the Fibonacci numbers, you get the product of the last number and the one right after that. Hey, I think we're out of time. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.